is a card that looks like this, okay? If you would at this time, just take that card, put your name, address, telephone number on the card, email, if you have email, put that on the card. Just fill it out right now, would you? Place it in the offering plate at a later time during our service. Uh, that gives us, uh, that helps us to know who you are, for us to make contact with you. And we, we appreciate that uh, so very much. We want you to know what's going on at New Hope Christian Church, and this will help us. Now, also at the bottom of that car, very important, there is a place for prayer request. And every week I look at these cards, I pray for these requests every single week. So if you have a prayer request, please put that on there. Something else I want to remind you of is this, that all of our sermons at New Hope Christian Church are placed on YouTube. Okay, got that? On YouTube. And you can go to YouTube, New Hope Christian Church, Nokomis, and you will find all of our sermons. And when you do that, if you would uh, push a button, there's a button there that you push to become a member uh, every time a new sermon is posted, it will send you a notice, okay? And you'll know that that's going to be on there. So, so that'll help you if you can't be here. Or uh, some of our northern friends, we go back up north, uh, you, can, you can see what's going on uh, at New Hope. Uh, we're so thankful to have our, boys, our Cub Scouts with us today. Guys, raise your hand in case you didn't see them. Some of our leaders, we love these people. They are so meaningful to what goes on around here, and we are so thankful uh, for them. I want you to know that they're Pinewood Derby. Now, this is we're set up for church today, right? But not, not on Saturday. And that's, uh, is that this coming Saturday, right? This coming Saturday, 10.30 to 2.30 p.m., this whole thing will change, all right? And it will be, it will be turned into a Pinewood Derby track, all right? How many of you remember Pinewood Der I remember my Pinewood Derby car making it. I never understood why I didn't win, okay? <laughs> I tell you, I did everything I could. But, uh, boy, it's going to be, this will be all set up for that, ready to go. It's going to be an exciting time. You might want to come just stop in for that. Uh, also, I want to remind you uh, of a uh, special opportunity that we have at a church, and that is Sandy Patty is going to be in concert February 17th at the St. Petersburg uh, Baptist Church. I think it's First Baptist St. Petersburg. We've got some tickets that we're selling for that. They're $15 each. If you see Ann Worthington, Ann, raise your hand. Look back in the back, you'll see Ann, okay? Just talk to her, and she'll see to it that you get a ticket. Now, let me talk to you about next Sunday. Next Sunday is going to be a very special day at New Hope, very special day. Uh, I am looking forward to next Sunday. Uh, our vision is to uh, reach people for Christ. That's what our vision is as a church. That's what we're all about. That's why we're here. Uh, it's fun to have a car show, isn't it? I mean, we love car shows, and we love Pinewood Derbies and all that kind of stuff. But that's not why we're here. We're here to reach people for Jesus Christ. And next Sunday, uh, February, February 4th, next Sunday, we're going to have a decision day here at the church. If you've never made a decision for Christ, either for church membership, to become a member of this local congregation, uh, either you live here and you become a member or you decide to choose a seasonal church membership, you live up north, but this is your church home when you're here, we want you to feel completely connected to this place. We're going to give you an opportunity next Sunday to make a decision for Christ to become a member of this church. Uh, to become a member, three things. Number one, you um, must be, have been immersed into Christ by baptism. Number two, uh, you've got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, your personal Lord and Savior. And number three, you've got to be ready to make a commitment that you're going to live for Jesus uh, the rest of your life. You want to serve Him. Those are the three requirements for church membership here. And that's it. And then also next Sunday, we're going to give you the opportunity, if you've never been baptized by immersion, to make that decision that you want to be baptized uh, by immersion. And we'll set up that time for your baptism and uh, all of that. And to be baptized into Christ, you must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, your personal Lord and Savior. And uh, I'll be talking about that next Sunday when I preach. 
But boy, it's going to be a great day as people make decisions for Christ. So you plan to come. And listen, I've talked to some of you about making decisions, those of you that I know that might be interested in that next Sunday. But, but some of you may be thinking about some kind of decision I don't even know about. And you want to talk to me. You stop me after this service and say, I want to talk to you about this. And we'll set up something, and we'll sit down and we'll talk this week, okay? So it's going to be a great day. Well, again, it's so good to have you at New Hope Christian Church. After this service, we're going to leave, go out the doors. We've got hot dogs out there for you, chips. Uh, We've got uh, soda for you. It's all free, so pick that up. Uh, There's literature out there about New Hope Christian Church and literature about AIDS. I'll talk to you about AIDS, International Disaster Emergency Service, in just a bit. But there's literature out there about that. I mean, we've even got Venice Magazine out there for you. So take all that stuff. Don't leave it. It's out on the table outside. And that's just Florida style, right? For it to be on a table outside. And so uh, you'll want to pick that up. Again, welcome. We're glad you're here. Farming God's Way, the country of Kenya, there's a drought. People are literally starving to death. Kids, babies, adults are dying. Their ministry stepped in to team with the Christian Missionary Fellowship missionaries. They figured out a way to uh, develop irrigation farms so that the people could use the land and could produce two crops a year. Those irrigation farms, get ready for this, those irrigation farms only cost $15,000 a piece. They've made a commitment to have 15 of those farms. Isn't it amazing what they've done? Each of those farms saves a minimum of 600 people. It's absolutely amazing uh, what they can do uh, through this particular ministry. It is so exciting. Hurricane Maria, you remember that, don't you? Hit Puerto Rico. Pretty much wiped out the country. They were into Puerto Rico immediately. They helped Anna Ritter. You saw Anna's picture on the screen just a few weeks ago. A missionary in Puerto Rico and her Christian church there, and that Christian church was on the forefront of providing the needs of people in Puerto Rico. Let's go to Thailand. They visited Thailand. They found a group of people living in a city dump. Imagine that. They were refugees. The missionaries said, we need a safe house, a place for people to come and where they can be safe. And so Ides gathered together the money to build a safe house. They normally don't even do that kind of ministry, but they said, no, we're going to do it, and they did it. They provided food, clothing, shelter, all the needs, spiritual needs of those people. And then they took that ministry. They didn't keep it for themselves. They took that ministry, and they gave it to Rafa House, and now Rafa House uh, is in charge of that particular ministry. Hurricane Harvey comes about. See, the, here's, the deal with their, here's the deal with their ministry. When a tragedy comes about, they don't have any money. They've got to raise the money fast, okay? And Hurricane Harvey came about, and of course you know the story in Texas with Hurricane Harvey. And I said, no, we'll help. We're going to jump in. We're going to help. They went to Houston to the current Christian church and the Crossbridge Christian church and, and the... Uh, uh, Bo, I think Beaumont Church was that in Louisiana. Is that where that was? And, and, uh, yeah, on the other side there. And they went in and they met the need of people so affected in that way. Uh, they team up with churches all over this country to pack meals to send to people who need food. 
and who are starving. And they have sent food to Afghanistan and Haiti and all kinds of other places. First contact I had, well, it wasn't the first contact, but first help contact I had with, with, um, with AIDS was at St. Louis Christian College when I was president there. I say the word Ferguson. You know exactly what that word means. It was a very difficult time. And we actually had students who lived in Ferguson, who had jobs, who worked in Ferguson, and they couldn't get to work. They couldn't leave their homes. They would try to come out to school for classes, but they couldn't get to work to earn their money to pay their school bill. And I contacted IDES and I said, hey, listen, is there any way you could help these students? And I mean IDES moved into gear immediately and they sent money to St. Louis Christian College to, to help those students pay for their education. I was so thankful and I know those students were so thankful for that. And then, of course, right here in Nokomis, Irma hit and New Hope Christian Church was affected by that. I didn't know what we were going to do. I was actually up north visiting some of you guys up north. Okay, Barb and I were in Michigan and Indiana visiting people. And every night, you remember, we sat down, we watched the news of the hurricane and wondering if our places would even be there the next day. Prayed for people in Nokomis and for people in our own congregation who were so active in the workforce of that hurricane. And then we saw the damage on the building from pictures that people sent. And we were in Indiana, and I actually pulled out my cell phone, and I pulled up an application for IDES. And I, just, I sort of sent them an email, and I said, listen, I don't know what the deal is. I don't know what we're going to need. I have no idea. I'm in Indiana right now, but we've got a big need and I sent them an email, and I mean with instantly. They got back with me, and they said, we're here for you. When you get back to town, we were going back the next day. When you get back to Florida, you take pictures. You let us know what you need, and we're there to help you. And, folks, listen, these guys sent $60,000 to make a difference with this church. We thank you for that. We thank you for that. And so I am just thrilled today to have Rick and Nancy Jett. Would you guys stand? Give them another round of applause, would you? Rick's going to come preach for us. Come on up, Rick. Guthrie, do you want to go on the tour with us and tell all about IG? You did a great job here this morning. Uh, it is our pleasure uh, to serve. We are just God's... You know, we're, we just administrate what God puts in our hands. Uh, we realized a long time ago what God puts in our hands is not for us. It's for his kingdom. It's to further his kingdom. And there is a great kingdom work being done all around the world. And it's always great to be a part of the family of God. And it's great to be here with you all today. And uh, to celebrate with you, really. I mean, things have, are coming along really well. And I'm just thrilled. We were looking forward to this. This was one of our... Highlights on our trip down here was to, to be with you all and definitely to be with Guthrie and Barbara. And, and uh, we do have literature out there, fill time, you know, take that. It really helps our gas mileage. If you take some of that, it lightens the load and we can get around a lot easier. Uh, but we'd love for you to learn more about our ministry and uh, what's going on. And, and we're just thrilled. Uh, and we've got a great day. And uh, we're just looking forward to just enjoying the whole day with you all today. Well, I'm going to share with you from God's Word here this morning. Uh, we're talking about uh, this, you know, friend day and, and reaching out and uh, loving others, and that's kind of where this message is going to go here today. So I hope that it'll be helpful and encouraging uh, to you. If you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 2, I'm going to read the first 12 verses. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. 
Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head, and then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What's he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked, Why do you question this in your heart? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk home? So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed, and they praised God, explaining, we've never seen anything like this before. Let's pray. Father God, we ask today that you would open our hearts and our ears and our minds, our lives uh, to your word. Help us today, Lord. Help this messenger of yours, forgive him of his sins, and help him, Lord, to be your uh, mouthpiece today to communicate your message. Help us all today, Lord, to go from here more uh, focused on what we're here to be and to do, and how we can bring glory and honor to your name. Uh, We pray you'll bless these next few moments as we study your word together, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage in Mark chapter 2, this event, is one of my favorites of Jesus' life. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, encounters that Jesus has with different people and so on, but this is one of my favorite because I definitely identify uh, with what's going on in this passage. And I'll tell you more about that later in the message. But right now, I just want you to understand, you know, there's there's some guys here in this passage that this would not have happened if it wasn't for four men. There were four friends that loved and cared for their friends so deeply that they did everything they could to get them, get their friend in front of Jesus. And that's what it's all about. That's what we are called to do, as already been stated, that God has called his people to do what they can to bring their neighbors, to bring their relatives, to bring those all around the world from all nations to come to know Jesus, who is the Savior of the world. So I want to use these four guys here this morning, and my outline's pretty simple. I'm not a real, you know, I'm not a great theologian by any means or anything. I keep it pretty simple. I'm going to just give you really four words, hopefully, that you'll remember here this morning. But each of these are kind of uh, characteristic, well, not really characteristics, but they're more of actions that we can take to bring people to Jesus. If you've got friends and relatives and so on, you're figuring out how can we reach them? How can we bring our friends to Jesus? Let's let's learn from these four guys here this morning, okay? The first thing is, is to care. The first thing we see from this biblical example is caring. But before you care, you must become aware. These four men really cared for their paralyzed friend because they were aware of what his life was really like. I think these four guys were basically his caregivers. And so they knew that his whole life had been lived on this mat or rug that was about three foot by six foot. They knew exactly what was going to be needed for his care. They knew that he was going to need to be fed, that he was going to need to be carried, that he needed to be, someone was going to have to clothe him, someone was going to have to move him so that he wouldn't get bed stores. They knew that also somebody was going to have to do the task of cleaning him after he soiled himself. Nothing could be done. They knew that there was nothing medically that could be done for their friend. No surgeries, no rehab programs, no treatment centers. There was nothing. And the man really had nothing. He had nothing to offer. He had no money, had no job. Seems like no family. He has really no future, it seems like. So what's he got going for him? Well, he's got four friends. He's got four amazing friends that care for him, have met his physical needs, and now they're going to do something even further. It says here that Jesus came back. When 
the news came that Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later. I like to think that these four, maybe one, maybe all four of them, were in the audience the first time Jesus came to Capernaum. And they heard him, and maybe they saw some miracles, or at least they heard about it. And so when they heard that Jesus was coming back, they immediately thought about their friend. Wow, what an encouragement, what a great thing this could be if we could get our friend in the presence of Jesus. Maybe there would be that chance that Jesus would speak the word, he would touch him, they would help him, maybe he could be healed. If nothing else, it would be an encouragement just to hear Jesus, because his words of truth and life and encouragement would be there. So they decided, we're going to get our friend to Jesus. They cared that much about him, they were so convinced that Jesus was his hope, that they were going to do everything they could to get him in the presence of Jesus. Now, I want you to know, this was not going to be easy. Logistically, this was going to be difficult. You know, today when someone is in this condition, paralyzed and not able, they're pretty much bed fast, you call an ambulance or you call somebody that has a stretcher and you move a person, and, and it's still not easy. Well, these guys didn't have that. What they're basically going to do is go into this guy's home and they're going to each take a corner of his mat and they're going to carry him wherever Jesus is. And I'm guessing Jesus is kind of like when you get off the airplane and the next uh, connection flight is clear on the other side of the terminal. I kind of think that's where it was. Where this guy was living and where Jesus was was probably quite a distance. But that wasn't going to deter them at all. So when they came to their friend, they said, Jesus is going to come here tomorrow. We're going to come pick you up, and we're going to take you. Now, when they said they were going to pick him up, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to come, and they're going to literally pick him up and take him into the presence of Jesus. They are so convicted, and they have such a love for their friend, they are compelled to do everything they could to bring him to Jesus. They were willing to sacrifice for their friend. They were willing to take risk. They were willing to be inconvenienced. They didn't really even think about themselves. They thought only of their friend finding and meeting Jesus. You know, we've got to come to a place in our lives that we understand the situation of people around the world. We need to open ourselves and open our eyes to the needs of others around us. We need to see their struggles and their hurts before we care We've got to become aware. Before 1900, there was no mass international communication vehicles at all. Today, we live in a media-saturated, internet-connected, cell-phoned, equipped world in which everything that happens anywhere is instantly available to us. I remember I was in Lexington, Kentucky when the earthquake hit in Haiti. We'd been in meetings there. We had just finished, and we were starting, and all of our cell phones, we started turning on, and they were all lighting up, and we got to this restaurant, all the TVs were talking about, and I mean, it was just like that. We heard about the mass earthquake in Haiti. So today, the lack of awareness is no longer an excuse for us not getting involved in caring for people in this world. We have come so maybe hardened, I don't know, or we just get so busy, I don't know what it is. But we need to open our eyes. We need to open our hearts. Proverbs 28, 27 says, Whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to their poverty will be cursed. It begins right here. Compassion doesn't begin here. It begins here. We've got to see. We've got to become aware. And as we become aware, we've got to open our hearts to allow God to move and work in us. You know, um, Guthrie did a great job of introducing us and so on, but I want you to know God's still working on this guy a lot because I, am, I'm, 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 I still see myself more than I see others sometimes. But back when I was in uh, southeast Kansas, I just started preaching. I was in a little church in southeast Kansas, and uh, um, we were doing a great, you know, things were going well there. And we had, uh, at that time, uh, uh, Russ Martin came out. Russ was with Whitefields Ministries, you know, remember Russ, and uh, with Reggie Thomas and so on. And he came out to our church to preach, and he was a fireball, and he was saying, uh, uh, Reggie's going to take a group of young preachers down to Haiti. Love for you to go, Rick. 
ah, yeah, that sounds great. He talked to my elders, and they all were real great about that. They were willing to, to send me there, and they started raising some funds. And at that same time, Nancy and I became acquainted, and we began to date, and it got kind of serious. And as they continued to raise the funds, they got enough for me to go, and they said, they, of course, they wanted their preacher to get married. <laughs> Somebody's got to take care of the parsonage, you know. So, uh, so they said, uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you take Nancy? And I go, yeah, that would be a good idea. And so uh, we kind of talked about it, and then, Zide Nutt said, you know, it'd be better if you guys got married before you went. That's a good idea, too. So Zide married us, and we went, uh, yeah, we went to Haiti on our honeymoon. I'm not a smart man. <laughs> no. Now, we did spend a few days in Orlando. I'll admit that. We did. But, yeah, most of our honeymoon, but it's a Caribbean honeymoon. I mean, come on, you know? I thought, all right. But anyway... But I want to tell you about my wife here, just a little bit. Nancy's sister, brother-in-law, were missionaries in Indonesia. And they had served there for many years. And Nancy had taken time out of her schooling there at Ozark to go and spend six, seven months over there visiting them and visiting other missionaries. So she had been out of the country. She knew what the other world looked like and all those different things. Uh, but I had no clue. Never been. The farthest I've been was Kansas, okay? So here I am in southeast Kansas. She had been out of the country. I had never been. This is my first mission trip. We went into Haiti. Wow. You know, that's all I can say. Time we got into the terminal, I was ready to turn around and come back to the U.S. But we were there for two weeks. My wife kept saying, we can do anything for two weeks. You can do anything for two weeks. Well, until you get the Haitian happiness, you can do for anything. But man, I tell you, I got sick. We'll show you the details. Anyway, we, we did. We did what we were called to do. We went to the churches. We stayed with this Haitian minister. And uh, he did his very best for us. And we stayed with them. And then we uh, began to realize what kind of life that they faced every day. Now, we realized that uh, staying with the Haitian minister we would get up in the morning and we would have to go out back into this area that had this spigot, basically, and that was our shower. And we were taking showers and then going out in the day with the minister to call on people. Well, his children were real friendly the first couple of days we were there, but about midweek, they weren't as friendly. Well, what we found out that while we were out visiting, these children were taking these buckets and going about a quarter mile, half a mile down this steep hill to a well and bringing the water up and putting it in the tank so we could take a shower. We realized we didn't need to be quite as clean as we had. But each day there would be people coming, Pastor, I need food today. Pastor, can you, I need medicine. I mean, it was constant. But again, at that time I was uncomfortable. I was, not, I just, I could not. I didn't realize God didn't send me to Haiti to preach. So we did. We preached and we had some great times down there. But it was to get my eyes and my heart open. I remember very clearly when we got to go home. We got to Port-au-Prince. We started, headed back, got on that airplane, started back toward Miami. And they brought out the airplane food. Oh, man, this is going to be great. So we, uh, we got the, the food. They started bringing it out to us. And I started getting into it after all the other stuff that I ate in Haiti, you know, I, I, I was really glad. And I was thrilled. And we were eating away, and I was so excited to get home. And I turned to Nancy, and I said, you know, Nance, this is going to be, it's going to be great to get back to the real world. And she turned to me, and she said, Rick, we just came from the real world. And she's right. And for the last 38 years, nine years that we've been married, God has taught me over and over again we have a great nation here. We have lots of opportunities. We have a lot of blessings. But we have a lot of responsibility as well. We don't live really in the real world. There are those today, 25,000 people each day die because of hunger, which we cannot even really fathom here. I mean, there's just no way that we can really understand a place that has no food but there is those kind of places. It's become aware, so we care. That's the beginning. And that's not just overseas, that's everywhere. That's your neighbors, that's your relatives. It's finding out what is their need, what is going on, and care about them. The second thing that we need to do, though, is get creative. These guys got creative. 
You know, it takes creativity to bring people to Jesus these days. The gospel message never changes, but the methods in getting that message to the people today have and they must change. These men get to their home where Jesus is teaching, and it's packed. They did not expect that. Even the front row seats are taken, you know. I mean, everybody was in there. They, they, the doors were crowded, the windows, they were people filled up. Here they come, I don't know how far, carrying this guy. They were sweating. It was hard. They set the man down. They go, man, we didn't plan on this. What are we going to do? And they start thinking about it. So a guy gets them together. Let's, let's brainstorm. Let's, you know, I'm sure one of the guys was just saying, let's just take the guy home. Let's get him out of the sun. It's, it's you know, too late. No, 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 no. We're gonna, we got this far. We're going to get him there. So they start brainstorming. Let's come up with some ideas. How can we get this guy in front of Jesus? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say too much, but they came up with this idea about going on the roof. Now, if you remember the roofs there in Palestine, some of them are just made basically out of uh, reeds and clay, and, and they got timbers in it, and they just kind of pack that, and it's usually kind of a flat type of roof. And a lot of times they'll have staircases on the other side of the house, and a lot of times they'll use the roof kind of as a patio or at least a place where they can go when it's really hot and so on. And so this guy sees the stairway, he looks at the roof, he throws out the idea, hey, why don't we take the guy up on the roof, find out where Jesus is, dig the hole in the roof, and put him right in front of Jesus. Not a bad idea. Is there any others? Let's hear them, you know, the, the brainstorming session here. No idea is a bad idea, but that's the best one they come up with. So here they are. They're dragging this guy up on this staircase, and they're getting up there. And here Jesus is. He's sitting there, and all the people are sitting, and they're listening. Jesus telling some great stories. He's telling parables, and people are just right on the edge of their seat. And all of a sudden, they start hearing a little bit of ruckus, but they're not too distracted yet. And then there's dust starts kind of floating around. And then all of a sudden, there's this crack in the first century plaster there and all of a sudden it falls down and hits this Pharisee right in the head you know and that was it that was the end of the everybody now what is going on and these guys are starting to dig and more dirt comes down and more of the reeds come down it's a mess and can you imagine what the homeowners thought <laughs> you know I'm always thinking here this guy was probably looking for a state farm agent you know uh, but here he is they got this hole in the roof and they looks up there and they see yeah he's right down there and they lower the guy right in front of Jesus now what do you think Jesus did I think he was delighted. I think if there was anything about Jesus, I, I kind of, you know, you've seen those pictures of Jesus sitting back and laughing. I think that's what he did, especially when that Pharisee got hit. I mean, I think he was like, yeah, yeah. The, and, but the thing is, he was there, he was just thinking, yes, there is four guys on this roof that get it. They understand it. They understand what the deal is. And he was going, right, that right brain creativity, go for it. Yes. This is what it's about. You know, there are countries today that are closed to the gospel. And something about our missionaries, they get very creative sometimes. They have to. In order to be able to go into these areas that are closed, they have to think outside the box a lot of times. In one of the European uh, countries, a little country uh, that had a war back in the day and uh, many of the homes were destroyed and people were killed and uh, eventually the, uh, our nation got involved and pushed them out and let this country stand on its own. But there was a lot of devastation afterwards and missionaries went in. And the couple we worked with, they, they contacted us and said, you know, we need to help rebuild homes. So we gave them funding and they started rebuilding homes. But they said one of the things is that they found is that they need a family cow. That the army, the enemy, when it retreated, would go through the farms and they would burn the farms, but they'd also take the family cow and kill it. Sometimes they would just bury it with its head and legs sticking up just to shame the people. So they said, if we could give these family some cows, this could be a great thing. So we took that on. We said, okay, we'll see what we can do. We put that out there. VBS has started raising cows for them. And, and before you know it, we had 150 families that received these cows. We went over there and visited with them. We talked to one of the young men that now has gone to Cincinnati Christian University and is now back out preaching and ministering there, but we asked him, we said, you know, what's the difference here? You raised in a Muslim church and a Muslim, or a Muslim family and so on. And he said, well, one of the things is that when, when the Muslims came, they, they rebuilt their mosque. But when Christians came, they helped us with our education, they built our homes, they gave us cows. And he said, that's when I wanted to know about this Jesus. Yeah. It's thinking outside the box. You know, in southern Sudan, Sudan at the time, years ago, was not divided. 
and we got involved. One of our board members got the idea, we need to get involved in Sudan. And the idea was is that they, in the capital, there was this hospital, and the conditions were pretty bad. And they basically were bad because they couldn't keep the sanitation well. They could, everything, the, the washing machines and the, all the things couldn't be disinfected and taken care of. So he said, if we could get a machine shop set up some way, we can go in there and we can repair these, uh, these machines and they can help keep things clean and hopefully cut back on infection and so on. Kind of outside the box, again, one of those creative things, ideas, but let's do it. You know, we finally went about and we decided to do it. We sent a man over there. He got three guys that were all raised in the Muslim. He taught them how to do the machine shop stuff, how to fix these things, and he taught them about Jesus. And those men became Christians. And then they went to Harare, to a Bible college there, and was trained. Then they went back up into southern Sudan, and today there's over 10,000 New Testament Christians. There is a, a hospital there is a Bible college, and the gospel is spreading because of coming up with an idea of fixing some machinery. Creativity. The same thing can happen right here. Think creative ways in which you can meet the physical and spiritual needs of people around you and see how God will use those opportunities to do his eternal work in them. Quickly, number three, cooperation. Doesn't just take care and doesn't take just creativity, but we got to work together. Notice that it takes four men working together to bring one friend to Jesus. And they did it. They partnered together. They shared the same goal, the same purpose, and they did it. Outreach is a team event. Evangelism is a team event. That's why God has gifted every Christian with a spiritual gift. Every one of us have a gift from God as we become a follower of Jesus to use in the furtherance of the kingdom. It's not just up to the preacher, not just the elder, but everyone. Now, there are some that have certain gifts. Some can teach, but some others can organize. Others have prayer. Others can, uh, they have the, the gift of mercy. Others have, you know, different very variety of gifts and talents God has given to his church. And it's all coming together in that one body that makes it happen. That's what I, I cannot exist without partnerships. You know, uh, again, appreciate and we're humbled by the, the, uh, introduction that Guthrie gave us, but it's the brotherhood. It's, it's the churches. It's, a, it's donors, individual donors that stand. It's the team effort that brings sides about. It's partnering with you right here to reach out into your community. It's partnering with other churches around. When we were down in, in uh, Purlington, Mississippi, right after Katrina, devastating again, but we decided to build 36 houses. Never done that before. Totally, again, outside the box kind of idea. But these people needed homes. So we built these uh, 1,200 square foot homes, uh, three bedrooms, two baths, I mean, full thing. And, and we just gave them away. I mean, we built them, and, the, you know, of course, they had, there was some criteria they had to have. But we started building these homes. Now, again, that was never going to happen with just the small staff that we had. But God brought us volunteers from all over the country. People from the independent Christian churches, but we also had Baptists, we had Mennonites, we had Amish, we had all kinds of different groups coming down using their gifts to build these homes. And in so doing, we planted a church there in Purlington, Mississippi, that's still functioning and reaching out and being the light in the midst of the darkness there in that area. We need to work together as the body of Christ. That's how we're going to achieve united a united and determined army can overcome the enemy. Finally, it takes commitment. Notice that these four men were committed to bring their friend to Jesus. It was their top priority. There was no half-hearted effort here at all. It was all out. Nothing, no obstacle, nothing was going to get in their way. The sense of urgency was there. They realized their, their friend was going to perish. Or their friend was going to die without seeing Jesus. So they got to get him in the presence of Jesus. Whatever it's going to take, we've got to do it. If we've got to put a sunroof in some guy's house, that's what we're going to do. I mean, we have got to get our friend in front of Jesus. Now I want you to notice there in verse 5. When it comes down, the man's standing there in front of Jesus, and Jesus says, your, your son, your child, your sins are forgiven. But notice there before that, verse 5, it says, seeing their faith, their faith, those four guys, 
four guys that are not even mentioned here by name, those guys, seeing their faith, he then turned to the friend. You know, usually healing stories speak of Jesus seeing the faith of the one asking for healing or for themselves or for their child. But here it's the faith not primarily of the man but of his friends because they were committed to their friend and God made him whole. You know, you talk about the healthiest guy in the world. It was this guy. When Jesus said, pick up that mat and walk, he was physically, spiritually, mentally, every way, he was the healthiest guy in the world. And people said, man, we've never seen anything like this. That's what happens when the kingdom of God moves forward, when things are begin to see and people's lives start transforming, they'll look at a guy, he can never become a Christian. Yeah, he becomes a Christian, guess what? They're going to go, wow, that's amazing. We serve an amazing God. God did a great work in bringing this man, saved him of his sins, and made him whole. Now, I told you earlier that this is one of my favorite stories, and it's because I identify with this story. I wish I could say I identified with the four friends. I don't. I identify with the guy on the mat. In the 1990s, I was in Marion, Indiana, ministering, local ministry there, and I began to uh, notice some health issues. Things started happening and went to the doctor. Knew this was in my family background, had not been diagnosed yet, but they went ahead and ran some tests, and they found that I had polycystic kidney disease. It's hereditary disease on my mom's side. There's no cure for it. The only hope I would have is a, it would be a transplant. But eventually the doctor said the day will come where you'll go into failure and you'll need to go on dialysis. So we went for several years there dealing with that. My health continued to decline. But on my 41st birthday, I went into total kidney failure. And uh, went into the doctor and said, you know, shoot me or put me up to this machine, something. I'm, I'm done. Fortunately, they were able to do dialysis that day and began. But my life changed. I remember coming home that night, laying in bed, thinking my life is different now. My life is depending upon a machine to keep me alive. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm going to have to go for four or five hours and sit there and let them cleanse my blood to keep me alive. My world got small to that three foot by six foot mat. Did that for about 18 months, up and down. If you know anybody that's on dialysis, you know they have their good days, their bad days, and eventually every day becomes kind of a bad day. While I was coming up and down, we were doing tests and different things. I started feeling good for a while, but then it started leveling out. Anyway, I kept on doing what I could. You know, I started doing the, still the ministry. My family was being definitely affected. We couldn't do vacations and things. It was hard. Couldn't eat what I wanted to eat. Couldn't drink what I wanted to eat. It was hard. My life was different. Went to a local minister's meeting there in Marion. Went to the St- Sirloin Stockade. Loved Sirloin Stockade. We went there, got our lunch. We went in the back room, had our meeting, and one of the men sat there beside me. It was named Gail Janowski. Now, Gail's a, a, a Wesleyan minister there in Marion, was at the time. Sat down, he knew about me. He knew that I was having health issues. He asked how I was doing. I told him, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm on the, I'm on the transplant list, but I'm still doing dialysis. We kind of chat, chat back and forth, talked about the church a little bit, and that's about it. He went his way, I went mine, and we continued. And I continued to go to dialysis and continue to struggle and do what I could. It was during that time that God did a lot of working in my life again. I mean, I'm telling you, I I keep him busy. And uh, my quiet time wasn't quiet at those moments. There were times, there were days, especially Monday mornings, I would just lay it out to God. Man, I don't know if I can keep doing this, God. I need some encouragement. I need you to show up here. Something's got to change. Well, about a month later, praying that kind of prayer, Gail shows up at my church one afternoon and says, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. We went into my office, sat down, and he sat on this couch, and I was in a chair, and he got very quiet, got kind of very emotional, and I go, oh, I wonder what's going on here. Didn't know him that well. I mean, I had no idea. I thought maybe he was going to ask me to pray at the next Thanksgiving community thing, you know, or something, but it was not that. He said, do you remember back a month ago when we was at the minister's meeting? I said, yeah. And he said, you know, I'm not going to tell you that God verbally spoke to me, but I definitely have this impression that God said, Gail, you could possibly help Rick. And he said, I can't get away from that. I said, well, 
I said, thank you. What an encouragement. Thank you. God, thank you. Here's a guy that came and all right, you're still listening to me. And he said, no, Rick, you don't understand. A little more than that. For me to be obedient to God, we've got to see if I can possibly give you a kidney. I said, Gail, that is very slim. You don't belong, you know, we don't, we're not relatives. There's all kinds of things that's got to line up here. You may have health issues that you don't know about. Not going to happen. He said, we've got to try. So I went on to dialysis, and we prayed and cried, and I went on to dialysis and sat down and started telling them that I got this guy that wants to give me a kidney, and they go, ah, oh, Rick, that, you know how that is. And I said, yeah, I know, but he seems to be sincere. And so our nurse that time, he started asking me questions. And he said, uh, well, how old is this guy? And I said, oh, he's about my age. Uh, how big is he? He said, oh, he's about my size. Well, what's he do for a living? Uh, he's a preacher just like I am. <laughs> well, he's taking all this information down. By the end of the time I had my treatment, he said, do you know his blood type? And I said, no, I don't. He said, well, find out. So I found out. I didn't even know what mine was at that time. So I asked, uh, and then we found out. Sure enough, his blood type was mine. So the transplant coordinator got all this information. She said, maybe we ought to talk to him. So they said, bring him down here. We got this psychological test that all these donors that want to do this go through. His wife said, oh, he needs that. <laughs> so uh, she got him in the car, took him down there, and he went through all these questions, met with all these surgeons, all these psychiatrists, all these things. And they said, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's not trying to be your savior. He's, he's just trying to be obedient to God. They took more tests. He was a match. This was in October of 98. On February the 3rd, 1999, they took Gail Janoski into one operating room and they took a very healthy kidney out of him. They brought it down to another OR and they placed that kidney into my body. And my world got wide again. And in my time with God afterwards, I get God, I don't know why. Don't know why you, you spared my life, but thank you. It was about a year later then that the board of directors came to me and said, Rick, we want you to consider being executive director of IDES. And I thought, okay. And since that time, for the last 17 years, Nancy and I, we've been to India. We've been to Joplin, Missouri. We've been to Thailand, all around the world. And this kidney just keeps on functioning. I had a friend that became aware and he cared. Talking about creativity, giving a kidney to somebody, that's pretty creative. Cooperation all along. I mean, this guy went through some horrendous tests. I mean, heart calves, oh, oh man. Went through them all. And commitment. He could have died trying to save me. Now listen. Listen to me very carefully. I am not the only one that is a recipient of such grace. Because you see, each and every one of us in this room here today have a God that saw our situation. We have a God that understands that we are all ill, terminal, dying, no hope, no, there's nothing else. Only his son is our hope. He cared and loved enough loved us so much that he got so creative he decided, now I've got to satisfy my justice. I've got, to, I've got to pay for the sin, but I want to show my love. And so he sent himself and took upon flesh. And as that child, and he grew, and he was tempted just as we were tempted to not sin, he became the perfect sacrifice. Talking about cooperation, Jesus cleared to the very end. Even in the night of the garden, he prayed, not my will, but yours be done, God. And then talking about commitment, he went all the way. He did give us life. He shed his precious blood so that we all may have life in him. And it's that kind of love that compels me to love others and to bring others to know him. You see, when I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss, but poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head and his hands and his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far, 
far too small. Listen, love so amazing, so divine, listen now, demands. It demands my soul, my life, and my all. That's what love does. Let's play ourselves before the Lord today and saying, God, I know some people. Help me. Compel, may your love compel me to do whatever it takes to bring them to you because of what you've done for me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, you're so good to us. Lord, may your love compel us today to love our neighbors, our friends, people around the world. Lord, may we take it upon ourselves today to make it our mission to bring people to Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Rick, for that message. I'm going to ask our music team to come forward and get ready to lead us in a song today. Would you come forward at this time, music team? God is so good. He works in our lives in such powerful ways. He works in the church. We are so very blessed, and we are so very thankful. Perhaps God's worked in your life, and you need to make a decision for him. We invite you to come today. Make that decision for Christ. Let's be standing. Let's sing together.